Welcome, family, to another edition of Stranger Thinking Media, where we attempt to address the problems of a modern world. So stay tuned. We have an awesome show for you today. And today we're going to dig into some very serious topics. So hang around. We're going to talk about the demonic defeat at the cross. Bet you didn't know there was a battle going on there. The serpent escapes jail, 90% of Nephilim in prison, one third of the princes join Team Satan, and the defeat at the cross. Welcome to our channel. Please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And most of all, enjoy the show. Psalm 22, verse 6, but I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn, they shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying he trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. The serpent escapes jail. What could that possibly mean? I think we all know who the serpent in the scriptures is. Or do we? Um, well, let's, let's go back there and see what it says. Genesis chapter 3, and verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, Ye shall not eat thereof. Ye shall not touch it, lest ye die. So that's pretty uh, plain and simple, isn't it? So she's talking to a serpent, a snake. Or is she? And I know that uh, that question pops up quite a lot. And, you know, if you get into the, if you, you take it at face value, okay, now you got a talking snake. Uh, we're talking zoology then, right? But was this really just a snake? You see, what I'm trying to do is get people more in tune to the spiritual side of things because the spiritual world is the big world. This is, this is the shadow world. When I mean shadow, your shadow is just a, a uh, you know, just an image, a silhouette of the real thing. You, you're the real thing. So your shadow is just an image of you. And it's only, you know, think about it. You're, you're a three-dimensional uh, object. But your shadow is only a two-dimensional object. Well, you could say the same thing about the spirit world. Maybe it is a, you know, four-dimensional plane, and we're just a shadow of it in a three-dimensional plane. I mean, you know, we think we know everything. We think we're so smart, right? But the truth is, although we have attributes of the most high because we're created in his image we're very creative just like he is very creative right but there's still things we don't know we don't understand and you can't go by just what you see because we only see like what is it three percent of the light spectrum for instance like there's 97 percent of the stuff that goes on around us literally we can't see it you can't see radio waves. You can't see microwaves. You can't see infrared uh, radiation, cosmic radiation, magnet. You, you can't see forces. You can't see a lot, most of which you can't see because you are dependent on, your, on the visible light spectrum in which your eyes are designed to see. So never get to the place and you know i know people think they're so smart and they they know you know I, i've never seen that so it must not exist well if that's the case then you wouldn't be around if all that you can see is all that there is then you wouldn't see it for long because there are forces holding this planet together <laughs> you know what i mean so just because you can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist so that's why I'm trying to get everyone to kind of go down that path. Genesis 3, chapter 4, or chapter 3, verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof. 
Then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So everybody calls this the tree of knowledge. Um, I've updated it. I call it the tree of tech knowledge because this technology we have going on, anything from transhumanism to Starlink to AI, we're going to get in trouble with this. You know, um, CERN, you know, the Large Hadron Collider up at CERN, trying to open portals in the space-time continuum. You know, and they've made some movies about that sort of thing. And what comes through, you might not want it to come through. But then again, um, if you read the Book of Enoch, and we're going to focus a lot on the Book of Enoch here, the knowledge was being taught to human beings by these angelic creatures called the Watchers. And they actually taught humans a little too much. Um, so we're going we're gonna to look at some of that. We're not going to focus totally on that. We're going to do a brief run by. So, so the serpent, uh, he was a liar from the beginning, and there he goes. He starts lying. He's a liar and a murderer. That's what the Messiah said. That's what he called him. So let's go to the book of Noah um, in chapter 4. Uh, now, remember, the book of Noah is it's kind of odd because it's not hardcore like the Bible uh, in terms of its uh, chapters and verses. So I, I basically said inside of the book of uh, Enoch is the book of Noah and chapter four of that book. So that's what we're going to read, read from. So verse 10 of that. And the third was named God. -Durel. He it is who showed the children of men all the blows of death. So he's one of the watchers. And he led astray Eve. Uh, Eve's original name was Chua. I'm not sure. I'm not an expert on it, but I don't remember the connection. But if you see the word Chua, that means Eve. So it says that Gadrel led Eve astray. Well, I thought it was a serpent. Didn't we just read a serpent led Eve astray? And not only did he leave, lead Eve astray, he shows men, um, you know, basically, well, what does it say? Eve then showed the shield and the coat of mail, the sword for battle and all the weapons of death to the children of men. And from his hand they have proceeded against those who dwell on the earth from that day and forevermore. So this particular watcher basically teaches man how to fight, how to war, how to, you know, he, he teaches them the weapons of war. Now, Azazel um, is mentioned before God, Darel, and if you understand the scriptures, Azazel, um, if you know about the you know, Yom Kippur uh, feast, uh, or what we call the Day of Atonement, they place the hands on the head of a goat, put the sins of the people on that goat, and cast them off into the wilderness so he can never find his way back. Well, in the Hebrew, the goat is called Azazel. But we know from the book of Enoch, Azazel was one of the chief watchers. And so what he taught men, it's, it's about the same thing here as Gadrel taught men, except He's the one that gets all the blame because apparently he's the one that had kind of the most influence. He didn't initiate everything, but he's the, he was the engine behind the whole thing. And so he got a severe punishment, and he was thrown into the uh, place of condemnation or the jailhouse, basically. And he got put, he had the, he got put in the deepest part. He got put in solitary. That's how bad Azazel was, and that's how, how much uh, he angered the Most High. And so, God Dell is apparently like his lieutenant. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Lord of the Rings, but uh, J.R.R. Tolkien was very, very, uh, he was a biblical scholar is what he was. He was a linguist and a, a biblical scholar. And if you read the, if you, 
if you are in tune to it, you will realize that his storyline comes from the Book of Enoch, a lot of it. He just overlays the World War II and med- medieval Europe. Between those three things, he comes up with Lord of the Rings, the storyline, basically. And uh, most people don't realize that. You know, they're getting a lesson in the Book of Enoch when they read Lord of the Rings. But if you read that, you'll know that that the chief villain uh, from, you know, who starts the whole thing, his name is Morgoth, and he gets captured and thrown in prison, you know, angelic prison, right? But his lieutenant is Sauron, who kind of continues the wickedness. So this is that that storyline kind of comes from this storyline. So God Drell is like Azazel's lieutenant. So he continues it um, and teaches men how to war, and that's like the worst thing he could. You know, the other the other watches were teaching them, you know, astronomy, astrology. I mean, you know, things that are maybe more benign, but when. Azazel taught him how to kill each other. That was it. He had to go. So that's that's a take on it, and uh, um, hopefully you see the connection there. But uh, also here's a here's an interesting point about God Tarell is that you know you see how it's spelled here G A D right, but in Hebrew there there would be no A. It's just G D right. But how is it pronounced? It's pronounced God. So, you know, something to think about. And I, that that would be a trick, wouldn't it? If uh, God Dell is actually still being worshipped and we don't realize it. So be careful who you pray to because the name of the Most High is Yahweh. I know some, some people say Yahweh, some people say Yahweh. Um, but understand, the Most High has a name. He told us what his name was, and he said, this is my name forever. He also says, my people will know my name. You know, that's something to think about. He, uh, you know, so, and then you got some people saying, uh, you know, we can't say the name because it's too holy. Well, so what do they replace it, replace it with? They replace it with Hashem. But as we're going to see, that word Hashem, I don't, think you want to be using that that name or that word or that term but let's continue um there's just a lot of little fine points in the scriptures that if you're paying attention to it stuff starts to line up stuff starts to make sense and i i encourage everybody to read for themselves not just the 66 books of the bible but read the apocrypha as well uh, read the Ju- book of jubilees read the book of enoch you know, these books are, you know, not just fairy tales. And, and people say, oh, they weren't canonized. Yeah, but canonized by whom? Whom is the great canonizer, I wonder? You know, something to think about. But these were scriptures. Bible just means book. Literally, it means book. And a group of men got together and decided which scriptures they were going to put in this book. And they left out about as much as they put in. So <laughs> you really need to think that through. What else is out there? So let's go to Psalm 22, verse 9. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. So 90% of the Nephilim are currently imprisoned. So when did that happen, you might ask? And keep in mind, there are things in the 66 books of the Bible <clears throat> that, are, that uh, you know, Peter, Jude, even uh, the Messiah himself, they quote things, and they're not in the Old Testament. So where are they? Well, they're in the book of Enoch, and only in the book of Enoch. So that should tell you something about the book of Enoch. So Genesis chapter 6 and verse 1. And it came to pass 
when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, and they were fair, and they took them as wives, and all which they chose, of all which they chose. And so there are people, and I'm not sure why they would want to, uh, you know, get rid of that, but there are people who say, oh, they're not talking about angels. Well, every time they mention sons of God in the scriptures, in the Bible, in the 66 books, it always means angels. But if, if that's not proof enough, if you go to the book of Jubilees, they tell you quite frankly, yeah, angels took human wives. So it's not even a, you know, it's not like it's some mystery. It's, it's basically most people don't ask, and so the people who know, they just don't tell. And you got to ask yourself, why wouldn't they want people to know this? Well, let's continue. Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them, the same became mighty, ma mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Now that word renown, that's an interesting word. Um, because that's not the action. That's not, that's an English translation of something else. So in the oldest text, it, it actually reads the men of, it's a Hebrew term, the men of Hashem, meaning the men of the name. And in some communities, you know, who aren't allowed to say the name of the Most High, they replace it with Hashem, or the name. Now that comes, that means, you, you have to get the gist of what they're trying to say. These mighty men, when they say men of renown, that's not actually a horrible translation. What they were trying to do was get a name for themselves and not be under the name, if that makes sense. So in a sense, they were rebelling against the name, meaning Yahweh, the, the God of creation. And they wanted to create a name for themselves. In a sense, they wanted to be gods. So you have to understand, and, and also the term Hashem has been um, also used uh, for other, uh, another deity. Uh, I'm not going to go into that right now, but that term is, is kind of, the, the translation doesn't give you the understanding of what this means. Men of the name. That's literally the translation. But renown, the reason they probably translated it as renown is because when you want to get a name for yourself, you want to, you want to, be, you want to be God, you know. He got a name for himself, so he's above all others. It, if you follow my point, if you're picking up what I'm putting down. And Genesis chapter 6, verse 23, and every living substance was destroyed. Now they're talking about the flood, right? which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and creeping things and the fowl of heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. It's emphatically saying the only survivors of the flood were Noah and his family, eight people, and, and the animals that were on the ark. So everybody comes up with all sorts of, oh, well, the, the Nephilim survived the flood. It's, they must have hit on the ark, or some of them went into the ocean and, and survived there. And, blah, blah, blah. and the reason they say that is because uh, at the time of Joshua, there were Anakim, which are giants, and they're the descendants of the uh, Nephilim, and also the Rephaim, which are giants, descendants of the Nephilim, and also the, the Rephaim. Uh, um, king Og of the, the Rephaim he's a giant he's the king of them and he's still alive and then he got uh, Goliath and his four brothers they're all giants so how did these giants survive the flood well the term giants is misleading because it's not 
it's the word is Nephilim. And King James translates it as giants because they always mention how big they were, right? But if you if you really dig into it, remember the reason the most high flooded the earth was because the Nephilim were overshadowing um, and replacing his creation, man. They were eating up the resources. They were, uh, you know, they, they were insatiable. They were greedy, too. They were warlike. Always want, it had to be a war. Got to start a war. It's peace. Nope, can't have that. Got to have war. Got to, got to strip the earth of all its natural resources until there's none, you know. And I'm saying all that because I'm going to bring this, bring this home a little bit. I'm not going to go all into it because I've, I've been through this before. But get the gist of what the Nephilim were like. They were greedy, warlike. They had no respect for the creation, the beauty of it, um, God's creation. They had no respect for God. Or in this case, I, I don't like saying the word God because we just finished talking about God to hell. So I'll say his name. His name is Yahweh, which means essentially the eternal. So a lot of times I'll say the eternal one because only God is eternal. Um, read the book of Timothy. So anyway, what we see is these gods, or these guys, excuse me, these Nephilim, destroying everything. And got to the point, men cried out to the Most High saying, save us from these things. Um, you know, because not only that, they're still taking women. You got to understand, when, when the Messiah says it will be just like in the days of Noah, people will be marrying and giving in marriage. Why did he focus on that thing? Not that marriage and being given in marriage is a bad thing, but you got to look at what was going on at the time of Noah with these Nephilim. So basically, they're replacing human beings. So the difference, the way the Rephaim and the Anakim survived the flood is pretty basic genetics. Um, we don't know it was chosen because he was perfect in his generations, genes. His line had not, none of the women in his line, had, you know, had the... Uh, gotten with these Nephilim. So there was no Nephilim gene anywhere in, in uh, Noah's line. So Yah says, I'm going to start with this guy to redo the whole thing. However, um, so many people have been tainted, especially, you know, it's in your blood, it's in your genome now. Once you mix with them, you've mixed, you've created a hybrid. The, the gene is in you. Now, it's a recessive gene, uh, gene apparently, so it's not going to pop out on every birth. Maybe, who knows, one in 100,000 births, you know, one of these giant guys pops out. Who knows? But remember, we're in the beginning of everything. There's not a lot of people on Earth at that point, not like we have now. So it was a problem. That gene would start popping out a lot, except that the Most High found Noah, right? But somebody... Probably one of the wives of one of his sons still had that gene. And so that gene survived the flood. And what happens with a recessive dream, uh, gene? You know, just like albinism, right? It's a recessive gene, right? And so what comes out, about one in every, I think, say, say on the continent of Africa, about one in every 20,000 births is to an albino. It just randomly pops out here and there. So that's just genetics. We're just talking genetics there. So that gene still within one of those eight people, or maybe a couple of them had it, who knows. It shouldn't be in uh, Noah's sons unless Noah's wife had the gene. Um, but I tend to think it was one of, the, uh, one of his son's wives. But the point is, every so often that gene pops out. And so what apparently happened by the time, you know, uh, Moses gets to the promised land and Joshua and all those guys, they see the Anakim, which are the descendants of the Nephilim, meaning enough of them had popped out and they, they found each other and started communing together and 
procreating with each, with each other, and next thing you know, there's a kind of a nation of giants, also called Rephaim. And so children of Israel's job was to exterminate them. We have to get rid of this. We have to keep, the bottom line is, they would supplant man just by their sheer dominance, physical dominance. And so Israel was tasked being the servants of the Most High. It wasn't just enter the promised land. It was, oh, on your way in, you got to get rid of these guys. We can't have them repopulating the earth because I'm not planning on flooding the earth again. But what, what he did know was that the Most High knew that the Rephaim, the Nephilim, I'll call them Rephaim and Anakim, and there's a reason for it. Nephilim were super giants, like kaiju level giants, right? So, you know, kaiju, Japanese, uh, Godzilla, and Mothra, and all that stuff. But they were super giants and super powered. Remember, their fathers were angels. Well, it's so diluted now with human genes that the, ref, the Nephilim offshoots have so much human DNA in them that they scale down. They're no longer these super beings. Yeah, they're a lot bigger than men, but they're beatable. As, as you find out as you read the scriptures, Joshua defeats them, right? So they're not... That's why I tried, if, if the Nephilim had survived the flood, uh, the children of Israel wouldn't have been able to take them out, especially a group of them, a nation of them. What you see is a watered-down version of Nephilim. So Nephilim were 50-50 human and angel, right? But by this time, that gene was maybe watered down to... 90% human, 10% Nephilim. So my point is, they weren't the huge, monstrous, uh, you know, genetic specimens of the angels anymore. They were more like men at this point. And so, I, I know I've gone off on a tangent, but the point is, there comes a point where, are Nephilim still in existence? Well, the answer is yes, but they don't have to be giants. So part of the uh, strategy, the espionage, is, and I didn't put it in this video. I probably should have. I'll do it in the next video. It says in the book of Daniel, and they will mingle themselves with the seed of men. What that means is now Nephilim, or I'll call them Anakim and Rephaim, meaning scaled-down versions, now we got super scaled down versions because you probably can't much tell them from normal human beings. So they're, they're now uh, covertly among us. Um, and that's what the scriptures are saying. When the, Most High, when, when the Messiah says, it will be just like in the days of Noah, there will be these Anakim, Rephaim types, but they are scaled down to the point they look like men but they have the hearts and the spirit of their predecessors, their ancestors. And if you look at just what they do, they're greedy, warlike, stripping the earth of its net of its resources until there's nothing left. You can see it. Just stop thinking in terms of they have to be giants. No, they don't have to be giants. Not at this point. They have infiltrated. They now just look like regular humans. And so that's part of what the, the, the rationale behind it being explained. So you have Nephilim, huge kaiju kind of creatures. I mean, uh, unstoppable. They're eating men whole as snacks, right? Warlike. They're fighting each other, killing each other. So, but then by the time you get to Goliath, yeah, they're really big, but they're just like kind of really large men. You know, like they could be in the NBA kind of. <laughs> they're bigger than that, but you, you see where I'm going with it. But they're beatable. Human men can defeat them. They just have, you have to be, what did it say in that movie? Uh, one stick, 
he snaps the stick. It was, oh, it was the Planet of the Apes. One stick, he snaps the stick. A stick by itself, weak. But he grabs a bundle of sticks, now he can't snap them. Sticks together, strong, right? A bundle of sticks is strong. You can't just snap them, right? So that's kind of what the Israelites did. They went in there as a team, as a unit, and took out the Rephaim and the Anakim, the offshoots of the Nephilim. So hopefully that breaks it down. And I see so many videos on this stuff that is just off the wall wrong. Nothing survived that flood but the eight people on that boat and the animals they carried with them. Unless you, could, unless you were a fish. I'm sure you were in fish heaven during the flood. But we shall continue. Yeah, I got, I, it took a little long time on that one. I wasn't, wasn't planning on that, but I felt like I had to explain that a little bit more because so many people are just, you know, really confused on that. And so-called experts are just not experts on this. Uh, so let's go to the book of Jubilees, chapter 10. And verse 4, so what becomes of the dead Nephilim? Well, does the Bible ever, ever explain the difference between a demon and a fallen angel? It, it can't, it, the 66 books don't, but if you read the apocryphal writings and you read the book of Enoch and the book of Jubilees, you know exactly what demons are. Because these Nephilim were not God's creation, and they're kind of superpowered, when they die, their spirits are not accepted by the Most High. And so, there's no place for them. So, their disembodied spirits have to walk the earth. But remember, they used to have physical bodies, and they long for those physical bodies. It's like shelter from the cold, you know, so it's a house to them, you know, some place to live. And so you get demon possession. They're looking for bodies. So you got to keep your doors shut. Keep your windows locked. <laughs> Don't let them in. Because once they get in, it's hard to get them out. Okay, so uh, chapter 10, verse 4. So Noah and his sons are experiencing the wrath of these disembodied Nephilim. And even this embodied, you know, if you've ever seen those little, um, uh, those movies, those uh, horror movies uh, where they're casting out demons, the exorcist or whatever, um, you, that's just a you know Hollywood version of it. But you, you see, even disembodied, they can create havoc, mainly through suggestion. You don't have to listen to them, but, you know, they're pretty, they've been around a long time and they know how to trick people. So he's, uh, they're being, um, they're being attacked, you know, in, by these demons, essentially. Um, disembodied Nephilim. So Noah prays to the Most High, hey, these guys, are, they're dangerous, man, and they're really angry. <laughs> they're like trying to mess everything up. And so whatever they were doing was so potent, Noah had to pray. So he says, but do thou bless me and my sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, right? That we may increase and multiply and replenish the earth. And thou knowest how the wa thy watchers, the fathers of these spirits, acted in my day. And as for these spirits which are living, imprison them and hold them fast in the place of condemnation. Put them in jail and let them not bring destruction on the sons of thy servant, my God. For these are malignant and created in order to destroy. Wow. Yeah, that's uh Yeah, that's not in the sixty six books of the Bible, but uh that's some important stuff for them to be leaving out. So you gotta ask, why would you leave that out? That sounds really important to know. But they did, they left it out. So let's uh, read on. So in uh, verse 49, and he said, let the tenth part of them remain before him and let nine parts descend into the place of condemn condemnation. So God, Yah, heard 
Noah's prayer. And he said, yeah, oh, human beings are no match for these Nephilim, even in their disembodied state. So he took nine out of 10 of them. So basically 90% of the demons that were roaming around after the flood because they had no place to go. Well, Yah gave them a place to go. He said, I'm putting y'all in jail with your fathers. And he slammed the door behind them, but he allowed 10% to remain on the earth. And there's a reason he did that. Um, you, you have to, essentially, you, if there's a looming test, you tend to study harder, right? So these, these are allowed by the Most High, essentially, to keep man on his toes. Man has to overcome this. So it's not just a, uh, you know, we, they got, man's gotten kicked out of the garden, so it's no more gimmies. By the sweat of your brow, you shall work. And these uh, disembodied 10 percenters are going to make sure you work. So are you, hopefully you're getting the gist of this. I'm trying to move slow. Uh, for those of you who have seen my other videos, you kind of probably know. Um, I, I talked about this at length in my Jubilee playlist series. So if you want to go back to the Book of Jubilee's playlist series, you can do that to play catch up. But I think I, I covered it pretty well here. Um, but get you a book of, uh, of uh, Enoch. Psalms 22, verse 12. Many bulls compass me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round about. They gape upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. And uh, I went over that in my uh, a previous uh, video um, where we discussed the bulls of Bashan. And they're not really bulls being talked about here. These are demonic forces. Once you understand what Bashan is, it's a land, but who ruled over it? A ah, king of the Rephaim, a descendant of the Nephilim. And that's no accident. That reference is referencing the fathers of these, of these uh, giants, the Nephilim demons. And so, as the Messiah, now this is King David talking. He's in, he's in the spirit. He's prophesying. But he's seeing through the eyes of the Messiah as he's being crucified. And what he sees surrounding him are demons der deriding him, railing on him, accusing him. But now when you actually, actually see the scene, they talk about this, the Pharisees. <laughs> They're like, yeah, he saved others himself. He cannot save. Yeah, these guys were demon-possessed, which the Messiah knew full well. That's why he said to the Pharisees, ye are of your father, the devil. Hmm. So he's equate, equating, and he's talking to these demons. We, we see physical men, but he's seeing these demons, for who they are and what they are. And he says, ye are of your father, the devil. So who is the devil? Hmm. Well, who's the serpent? Hmm. Well, let's see. The serpent deceived Eve in the garden. But then in the book of uh, Jubilees, it, doesn't it say that uh, God did it out? Or is it the book of Enoch? My bad. It says God did it Deceived Chua or Eve. Um, by syllogism, the serpent deceived Eve. And God Durell deceived Eve in the garden. Therefore, the serpent and God Durell kind of has to be, have to be the same person. Except the serpent isn't a name. But God Durell is a name. So you could say that the name of the serpent and the word serpent. I, I don't mean to get on this subject, but was it actually a serpent or was it a seraph? Set one of the seraphim, a type of angel, which God kind of would be, right? So keep that in mind. God this is just how I see it. God comes in the form 
of a serpent. He is a seraph, one of the seraphim, and he deceives Eve, right? So she's talking, is she talking to a snake? Is it a talking snake or is it a, an angel? And that angel may have come in a certain form, but it says it was God Darrell that deceived her. So if you're picking up what I'm putting down, that would make God Darrell kind of the devil. And this, we're going to get more into it because it gets deeper. Let's, let's keep going. Um, this is getting long. I'm trying to push through this. Then one third of the princes join Team Satan. Now, what does that mean? My goodness. Yeah, this thing gets deeper and deeper. So we, we see here the Tower of Babel. That's my version of it. And at the time of the Tower of Babel, something. Thing happened. Do you remember? They were talking about uh, um, Yah Yahuwah says, Father Yah says, and let us go down and confound their language, right? Who's the us? I always ask that question. Who's the us? People just, I don't know. So Genesis chapter 11 and verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them. That's a, that's a pretty powerful statement. Nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Now, this us is different from the us in Genesis uh, 1, where it says, let us create man in our image. Okay? That us is not angels, because men were not created in the image of angels. That's a different us. And we talk about that also. Um, you should read... Uh, my playlist series, the God species, we we go into that, and it's kind of it's kind of tough. You have to pay a lot of attention to those, uh, the God species, and God by any other names playlist uh, series. So I try to organize these into their playlists. So if you're on a certain topic, it, you can kind of deep dive into it. But this us refers to Yah, and angels and most people believe it was 70 angels because of what gets said next so deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 8 now this is the king james translation now mind you it's important that i say that because there is an important little statement in here that may not be translated correctly and that changes the meaning and I don't know if that was done on purpose or not but the oldest manuscripts and even some modern ones uh, agree with that so they use the older translation because it actually makes more sense so this is, this is the translation that doesn't quite make sense so it's King, J King James which is a very popular Bible uh, verse 8 when the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. You know, the problem with this translation, he set the bounds according to the number of the children of Israel. Except that children of Israel don't exist yet. So what is, okay, what does this mean? Well, let's go to a different translation and maybe it'll make a little more sense. So again, verse eight, this is the uh, English standard version. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. Sons of God always means angels. 
But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. So this makes a difference. Now, according to the scriptures, there are 70 nations. And most people, the way it kind of sounds is that uh, each angel was given a nation to oversee. Now, the truth is, it could be much, much more than 70. I tend to believe it is. And there's a reason I believe it is, and we're going to get into that. Just like the watchers, they said there were 200 watchers. Well, the, the 200 were the chiefs, and they broke down their order of uh, command, you know. But I think there was a lot more than 200. So there were 200 chiefs, just like in this case, there's probably 70 chiefs. But then there's a rack of other angels. So he's kind of redoing what the, the, the uh, watches were supposed to look over men to keep them kind of on a straight and narrow. So now he's just appointing another group of angels to do the same thing. But of course, he's the most high. He already knows what's going to happen. So what we see here is a buildup. So you got the watchers in jail. We got the children of the watchers, 90% of them, in jail with their dads. Now we get a new group of angels coming in. And they are, are supposed to look out over men. But angels are not perfect beings. As we have seen, they can, they can uh, covet. They can lie. They can steal. <laughs> they get lustful. They got issues, right? Now, there's, there's the holy angels, you know, just, like, just like on this earth. You got people who are good people. And then you got people who are just despicable people. So, anyways, so God puts a new group of uh, angels in charge of men. Here we go again. Do these angels fare any better than the watchers? So this is the same uh, take on the Tower of Babel scene, uh, but you find this in the Book of Jubilees. So I, I highly encourage you to get you a copy of the Book of Jubilees, Book of Enoch, and go to town. Study them, because I, I couldn't put it down once I started. I was like, how come they never taught us this stuff? This is like, wow. So Jubilees chapter 10, verse 22 Go to, let us go down and confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech and they may be dispersed into cities and nations and one purpose will no longer abide with them ah, till the day of judgment. So men get scattered, but as you get towards the end, they start coming back together. And I think most of us understand that a one world order is kind of coming. So that's, and the fact that the Most High hindered that, up, or he will hinder that until the last days, tells you where we are. And there's that scripture, he who hinders will hinder until he be removed out of the way. Then that man of sin shall appear. Oh, Nimrod Jr. That's what, is, that's, what that's all leading to. So understand, history doesn't repeat itself. But it sure rhymes. Keep that in mind. The names could change, but it sounds the same, right? It's like bad poetry. And the Lord descended, and we and we descended. It's uh, coming from the point of view of one of the descending angels, and we descended with him to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. So. All right, we'll, we'll continue, but I just want you to have a good, strong understanding of where I'm coming from with this. And by all means, I'm not like a genius or something. This is just me reading and putting two and two together. And you guys are just as, just as capable of doing this. And a lot of times, people will see things, and I was like, I didn't see that. That's a, that's a good one. And, you know, they'll, they'll send a, a comment in and say, hey, you forgot this. I'm like, Good one. And, you know, I'll internalize it, right? So nobody's in a vacuum. You learn, you know, you learn by, what does it say? Our iron sharpens iron. 
So, you know, you can learn on your own if the Most High is guiding you, but it's nothing like getting with a, a group of believers with someone who have understanding and you all sit down because you're all seeing something maybe a little different. So, you know, and, and that's a good thing because you have to piece the puzzle together. Psalm 22, verse 15. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me about, and the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. More crucifixion language. The rebellion fails at the cross. So at the cross, it all comes to a head. So everybody talks about the, re- the great rebellion of the angels. But the way I've always heard it, it's always been the same. Yeah, this happened before the creation of man or at the time of the Garden of Eden or something. No, that doesn't happen. There's only one, rebe- one, one actual real rebellion, you know, not individual rebellion. But it's not at the time of, you know, the serpent in the Garden of Eden. It's not before the earth. I know people say, hey, um, the words uh, was, uh, you know, that were translated in English as, and the earth was uh, void and uh, without form. The Hebrew words being tohu and bohu, meaning made to become that way. Well, maybe. I mean, I used to believe that, that the earth was destroyed by some cataclysmic event. That's what I thought, but that's not necessarily how that's translated. But, you know, we'll, we won't bash it too much because it could be some truth in there. But the rebellion that the scriptures are talking about happened not in prehistory, not at the beginning of history. It happens at the crucifixion. When Christ dies for our sins. And if you understand the Bible is written a certain way because this Yah does not, the Father does not necessarily want the Satans to understand everything. And only, you know, if, if Jesus or Yah, Yahusha, as I call him, this is his true Hebrew name, he's got his disciples that eat together, basically, he's, you know, they're together all the time. And there's stuff they didn't know until after it happens and their eyes were opened. Had the Satans understood that by killing this man, they would free humanity from the wages of sin and death, they probably wouldn't have killed him. But being evil, wicked, covetous, adulterous liars as they are, it was easy to ensnare them in their own traps. So basically, they see an opening, they beat the Messiah to a pulp through human men, right? Demon, demon hopping from one man to another, right? Demon hopping. I'm going to use that. Demon hopping. Yeah. It's like that movie Fallen, where people would touch each other and a demon would transfer. It's kind of like that. They, they were flowing. But remember, demons can only flow when there's no insulator. It's like electricity. Had anybody, and, and of course the disciples were insulators, the, the, that wickedness, those demons couldn't access them. And so Christ could use them. So they, they, were, they were insulated. They, you know, they were good people, right? They were faithful. And so they were insulated from the demonic forces. And so you do have tools to defeat the devil. You just got to use them. So anyways... We're going to find out, let's, let's really look at this. Why do people think uh, there's this great rebellion of the angels that took place at the beginning of time? I mean, I, I, I kind of get it because I believed that at one point, but now I don't because I know this. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 3. Let's look at it. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon. And there's a reason the dragon is red. I won't get into that in this video, but yep, it's not an accident that he's red. Having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. I have a video about that. It's called uh, Seven Heads and Ten Horns. 
you should watch that to try to figure out what these seven heads and ten horns are. And it's kind of on levels, too. There's, a, there's an obvious meaning to it, and I kind of deal with it in that video. But there's more. So uh, watch that video, too. Seven heads and ten horns. And seven crowns upon his head, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and then cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, this is the scripture that's kind of used to say, see, the devil took a third of the angels with him. Well, got to be careful. It never says that anywhere in the Bible. Not in there. Nowhere in the Bible does it say the devil got a third of the angels to follow him. In fact, let's look at this. Now, it could mean this. Remember, the stars of heaven could also mean Israel. Remember, uh, Joseph had the dream and the stars in the moon, 12 stars, the sun and the moon bowed, out, bowed down to him. So could it mean that the dragon had either slain a third part of Israel or had uh, corrupted a third part of Israel? Or you follow what I'm saying? The stars could simply mean the children of Israel. In this case, the Judeans. Because the dragon is the Roman Empire. So you can look at, look at it that way. But, you know, we'll, we'll hold on to that with two fingers. Let's just say it does mean angels. And, um, you know, well, what, what does it mean? He took a third. You mean uh, an entire third of God's, of Yahweh's angels just jump ship? That's not good. I mean, a third of them? And remember, in the scriptures, it talks about hundreds of millions of angels created. You know, you just... So that's a lot of angels that would, were, were bowing on the Most High if that's the case. Or does it mean something else? And maybe it's not as many angels as you might think. I mean, you know, if you think about it, it was 200 watchers. And, and like I said, there's probably more. Those were 200 leaders, but probably a good number of watchers. But then came those 70-ish angels and whoever else came with them, whatever uh, other angels. Maybe they were the 70 captains and they had, you know, troops under them, angelic troops to look over men. So when it says a third of the angels, what angels? What angels? So uh, Revelation 12 and verse 5. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations. So, you know, that's a, a kind of a hint. So she, who's she? Is it Mary? Kind of. But, but more emphatically, it's Israel, the woman, right? Um, so she brings forth a man-child to, to rule all nations. Who's that man-child? That's the Messiah. So wait a minute. So let me, let me get this straight. So Revelation chapter 12 is about what was going on at the time of Messiah. It emphatically is not about the time of the beginning or the time of his prehistory before, before the beginning. It's not that. This rebellion is occurring. Remember, it's the Apostle John is writing this on the Isle of Patmos shortly after all these, these things happened. So, and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So we're obviously talking about the Messiah and at the time of the Messiah. So play on. Revelation 12, verse 6. Okay, this is what happened to the woman. To the woman. That is actually being specific to what Israelites? Well, the Kodeshim, the chosen ones, the, the remnant. That's the woman. Not the entire nation, because there's a lot of Pharisees and Sadducees running around that piece too. So no, we're not, we're not talking about them. We're talking about the believers. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had the place prepared of God 
that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days, twelve sixty. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. Okay. What angels? What angels? Well, what happened to the 70 angels? Did we just forget about those guys? Oh, no, they were here on earth watching over men, just like the 200 watchers did. And a lot, and I'm not saying all of them fell. Sounds to me like about a third of the ones assigned to watch over men at the time of the Tower of Babel were seduced by somebody else. Now, now peep this. Remember we talked about God Zell deceived Eve, but the serpent was the one that deceived Eve, i.e. God Zell is the serpent. Now, the serpent was cursed. What it emphatically doesn't say of the serpent, God Zell, is that he was thrown into jail. Now, now feel me on this. He he, he was uh, punished. His punishment was to crawl on, on his belly and wander the earth. So his, his punishment was not to go into the place of condemn, condemnation with the other watchers. He was left. Oh, man. So it gets interesting. So he's left. And then it looks like these 70, 70 angels. Now, remember, he's left with, and he's also called Mastema in the book of Jubilees, which is the chief of the demons. So this one watcher angel is chief of these 10% of demons that are left on the earth. Remember, 90% got thrown into jail with their daddies. So there's this one guy, God Dodell, who who didn't get that punishment, but he got a different punishment, and that's being bound to the earth. And then you got the 10% of the uh, uh, demons or the disembodied Nephilim. So now he's got a little kingdom going, right? But then these 70 angels come down and apparently could be, you know, those 70 and their, and their, and their troops. Well, God well, could have convinced them. It's not like angels are, are necessarily really good people. <laughs> they got issues just like everybody else, right? It could be that God Dwell, uh, got to them and took a third of those guys. So now he's got a kingdom. He's got a bunch of demons and a new group of fallen angels. Cause remember the watchers are in jail. They can't do nothing until the bottomless pit opens up. And then, Oh my goodness, you don't want to know. So you're getting a picture. If 10, if, 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 if the most I had to imprison 90% of the disembodied Nephilim or demons, because they were too powerful, even in the disembodied state. Wait till that bottomless pit opens up. I mean, we, we're having problems with the little 10%. Wait till he opens up that bottomless pit and, and uh, <laughs> the other d- demons come out along with the fallen ones. I'm assuming they're going to get out. I'm not so sure, but um, you know, there's a reason I say I'm not sure they're getting out, but that bottom, bottomless pit opens and they talk about demons popping out. So at least some more of these uh, disembodied uh, Nephilim types come out. Okay, so where are we? Um, and the woman fled into the wilderness. Uh, we did that. Three, tw- okay, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. So, okay, think this through. Remember the book of Job where it says uh, the Most High called the sons of God together and he said, hey, have you seen my servant Job? And Satan was among them. Satan simply means ad- uh, adversary. It's, it's not a name. So Satan could simply be God to know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, uh, let me, did you see my servant Job? 
And I'm gonna I'm gonna say it like this because I really think this is the case. And God Lorell said, uh, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just because you hedged him about, but better better if you uh, if I touched him, he'd curse you to your face." So we start seeing getting a picture here. So we see God Lorell, adversary number one, his, and he also called Mastema in the Book of Jubilees, and his. 10% of all the Nephilim, disembodied Nephilim, are still under his command. And you, now you got the 70 angelic commanders who came down during the Tower of Babel and the angels that came with them. And it sounds like a third of them might have joined forces with God Delel, who was bound to the earth because he was cursed in the garden. Right? So this is getting deep. And I'm not saying I'm 100% on this, because like I say, the stars of heaven could mean all sorts of things now, right? So, um, but I doubt seriously that the devil went up there and got a third of the angels to come down there. You know, that that's something a little different. But anyway, uh, we're going to bring this, bring this home. So say that he has his little kingdom now, a third of the angels... And all of the demons, and when I say angels, the ones that were set to, to stand over man, how would God do that? Or Mastema, the chief of the demons, how would he entice a third of these angels? Well, he'd been doing it for a long time. He's good. He's got the gift of gab. Because when you get to uh, Daniel, and he's talking about the prince of Persia, well, who's this prince of Persia that could withstand Michael the archangel? You guys remember that story? Go read it. Because no human man could withstand uh, Gabriel and, and fight, fight uh, Mike, Michael the archangel for 21 days. Yeah, that's, that doesn't even make sense, right? No. This thing called the prince of Persia, remember Paul talked about principalities, rulers. You know what I'm saying? In high places, yeah, these are principalities. These principalities. What is, what is Michael called? The prince that standeth for the people of, of the Most High. Right? Michael is called a prince. So the prince of Persia is obviously an angelic being that is strong enough to give Michael a fight. But Michael overcomes him. Because, you know, he's Michael, right? So, anyway, up until that point of the cross, remember Satan, God to hell, could go before an accused man. They even talk about it in the book of Jubilees. Only he's called Mastema, chief of the demons in that book. And he's called Mastema because he's not a demon. He's a fallen one. He's God to hell, right? And so, but he's chief over the demons that are left, right? Floating around. So anyway, he's also called Belial and the devil and all this stuff, Lucifer, whatever you want to call him. But he's been going around, him and his minions and deceiving men and causing men to fight each other and kill each other. But there's a war because he's in the middle of it. But he's also set his, remember, he's got his minions in, in this physical world too. The descendants of the Nephilim. You got to go back to Daniel where he says, and they shall mingle themselves with the seed of man. And that's why the, it says that the feet of the statue in Daniel is iron mixed with miry clay. They do not coalesce. They do not adhere. So it doesn't work. You don't hear me though. Come on now. So I, I'm hoping you have seeing this a little bit and how this thing, I might have to go over this in, in more detail on, and shorten it up, break it up into shorter points. I'll try that. Uh, but anyway, up until that point, uh, Satan, as it's said, as he's called in the Bible, could go before the Most High. He could join in on the Divine Council, you know, put his two cents in, usually they accuse men and uh, but 
Do you think that the Most High will, uh, will continue to allow this after he kills his only begotten? He kills the Father's beloved Son. Do you think at that point he would have access? He's got access to heaven all through the Old Testament. Uh, let that sink in. He doesn't have to war. He just goes up there. Hey, I, you know, I, I was watching these men, man. They're messing up again. Accusing us, accusing us. Night and day, accusing us. Well, that was his job. But when he killed the Messiah and the father already knew what was going to happen, he had one of his demons enter into Judas Iscariot, which means Judas from Kirioth. And that means something too, but that's another video. Um, but he enters in and he does the work. Maybe one of those strong bulls of Bashan got into him. But it was at that moment that he no longer had access. And he tried to go up there and he gets met. He gets met head on by Michael and his angels. And then there was war. And he was cast to the ground, no longer having access at all. It was at that point that he lost his access. And it says, the dra Woe, woe, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth, for the dragon has come down to you in great wrath. That was at the time of Jesus. Jesus, or Yahusha is his name, real name, Yahusha HaMashiach. Right? He's named after the father, whose name is Yahuwah. It's very important, but I won't get into that on this. So anyway, he lost access to heaven at that moment, at the crucifixion. And he could no, no longer go back up there. He tried to force his way back up there with his, his, new, his, new, little, his new army. And they were kicked out, summarily kicked out. And that was that. Can't go back up there. So that's a lot, right? Revelation 12, verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. See, he wasn't up in heaven this whole time. They tried to make a to bum rush it, and then found out, oh, change, the, change the locks, you can't get in, <laughs> you're out. You are out, buddy, and now you must wait for the day of judgment along with the watchers. Although the difference is this one is not in jail. He's still roaming the earth. But now he's got a crew and they're going to do as much damage as they possibly can. Peep that. You know, I tell you, this story just gets better. Psalm 22, verse 22. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. O cha bekehala be'amatsum ahalalega. Oh yeah. So we'll we'll leave it off leave off at that and uh, I don't know I got fired up on this one I kept going on it you guys you should have said something <laughs> but I I really got into this one and I, I really hope people see this because that's a lot of information and it's no joke we fight not against flesh and blood but against spiritual wickedness in high places you need to understand that my friends. So anyway, I thank you all so much uh, for continually supporting my content. If you did enjoy this video, hit the thumbs up button, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell. And share this with your friends and family. I'm sure they'd find it interesting as well. I'm very excited to continue this journey with you. I very much appreciate you all, and shout out to the channel members. Appreciate you guys so much, and may everybody have a beautiful and blessed day. Who's in the body of Messiah, Yahusha, HaMashiach. And I'll see you on the next video. Shalom.